down here. And if you want to, if you have time, then you can do Q and A. Um, that's up to you. If there's any, if there's any questions. Sure, sure. I don't, I don't know how many people will be on this, but it's we'll it's, it's fun to talk about. So. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this next round of presentations on the joint warfighting presentation track. I have here Mr. David Geddes, and I will let him take the floor. Well, hello, everyone. I appreciate the time. Thank you for making my session. Um, I'm going to, I'm, my name is David Geddes. Uh, I have a small software uh, consulting company called Cogsoft. I represent several. Um, innovators throughout the AI space. One of them today I'm going to be presenting um, is called Veloxity. Um, Veloxity is uh, located in Atlanta, Georgia, and they are a defense uh, contractor, typically sub, um, but have some really neat uh, technologies that I'm going to share with you today. Um, and afterwards, I'll try to make some time for you to ask me some questions. Um, and so I, I work with them very closely. And um, let's just jump right into working through this presentation. Uh, I think the presentation is probably going to be about 10 minutes. I have some videos at the end that you'll be able to watch as well. So let's uh, share my screen. And let's get going here. OK, so. Um, Veloxi has been around for 32 years. That's quite a, that's quite an achievement. Um, they have been um, uh, solving really interesting problems across the DoD space, mainly through um, small programs and research projects. Um, although the genesis of their technology um, really is quite extraordinary, um, and uh, that project uh, that their technology came from was a around $150 million project back in the late 1980s. So um, Veloxity formerly uh, was called Applied Systems Intelligence, and um, they decided to get a cooler name. And uh, so that's where they are today. But down below here, you can see some of the uh, various areas that we've been active in. And there are numerous other projects from NASA and so forth. You can imagine 32 years, uh, we've seen it all. Um, so um, warfighter systems are really what Veloxity does. And um, my father is Norman Geddes, and I'm, so I'm lucky to have a naval test pilot as a dad. Um, he's very well known for mapping out some of the cognitive limitations of pilots in, in the very well-known Smith Geddes pilot oscillation theory, which is now a criterion. And he was the pivotal chief engineer of the pilot's associate program which is the genesis for our technology stack. Um, currently today, we have a, a wonderful um, retired Lieutenant Colonel John Maryhew running the company. Um, Maryhew is a very well-known rotor aviation uh, trainer um, group. I think he was, a, I'm pretty sure he was a group commander. He's run various programs out of our uh, various uh, entities that we've worked with. We'll say that we've got a, obviously a great uh, team of ninja software engineers too. I'm not a software engineer. I'm just the guy who talks too much. Um, so what do we do at Veloxity is really what we watch your six. And I mean that from the very beginning when we built the first um, research testing with computers on aircraft and uh, essentially taking the role of the co-pilot and they're referred to as associates. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But essentially, what associates are really good at doing is, is um, they have a very broad domain space model. Um, in, it's how we build them with various models. Um, but their domain space model is very broad, and it can integrate and understand a variety of different inputs from across the battle space um, from other war fighters. These are all just examples here. Um, and these are all actual projects that we've tested our systems in over the 30 years that we've been doing our work. Um, but essentially, watching your six means to us, you know, information superiority. And so really, all of these different levels throughout, um, throughout the battle space are creating a variety of different data. And that data is both quantitative and qualitative. 
And having a system that can actually churn through that in any meaningful amount of um, response time um, to help give deeper visibility and better visibility to these platforms, you know, to other systems. So system to system, human to system, human to human. So this is a very complex um, battlefield space. And so we deploy our, our systems, they're referred to as associates, to essentially watch over, um, watch over humans um, and trying to help them accomplish uh, their goals. Um, and so watching your system to us means that our systems have to adapt faster than humans. And so we've tested our systems, like I said, for over 30 years. Um, we're TRL-9. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks kind of point to the kind of NASA traditional ways to score uh, technology readiness levels. But we're, I think in 2008, we were had a review by NASA TRL-8. And so I'm fairly sure from all of the commercial spinoffs that we've been involved in that we're, we are a very mature technology stack. But essentially, we can do all these different things um, to help humans adapt to the battlefield much faster than anyone else. And that includes our adversaries. And so we're able to exceed the human cognitive limit and um, bring out and flesh out information and uh, handle changes um, inside of the between systems and inside of the data world faster than a human. OK, and so we integrate. We're referred to as an integrator, but we integrate our systems into just about anything. And I don't I'm, I'm it's not a an exaggeration. I'm just saying that, you know, any any digital system, digital world, we integrate our associates into. And so that basically what that allows us to do is interact uh, between different systems, uh, different troops is somewhat of a repeat of the previous slides. But um, we we tailor our associates to an individual role. OK, so we we can tailor associates for, let's say, a battlefield planner or a command and control intelligence officer, or we can even tailor a system for an actual um, brigade commander, all the way down to actual platoon, um, all the way down to, you know, to an individual troop or an airman. So we tailor these systems to help watch over them, uh, to look where they can't look. And this means, you know, scouring through vast amounts of information um, and um, comparing that information across different levels. So we build these personalized, intelligent digital agents. They're really agents. Um, uh, we build them off of what are referred to as a belief, desire, and intent architecture. And so we fuse those two methodologies, the BDI architecture and an agent um, methodology into one. And so these are personalized, intelligent agents that are, um, that are semi-autonomous, which is an important factor to, to talk about in just a minute. But essentially, we, we monitor, analyze, we plan... Um, we execute tasks through this system. Um, over on your right here, you see a, a little diagram of how we talk about it internally. It's really observe, orient, decide, and act. It's a, it's a graph-based system that is uh, traversing the graph 10,000 times a second, doing this, observing, orienting, deciding, and acting on the inputs, uh, anything that's coming into it. And of course, this allows it to... to um, to execute tasks as needed and, or ask a human, a user, if, if it has the authorization to execute a task. So you can imagine going into a spreadsheet or going into any other complex system, how long that might take you to, to accomplish your goal inside of that system. We, we essentially speed that up. So one of the really cool things that uh, we've come to realize about our systems, and I think uh, we've proven this pretty extensively is that our systems don't learn. Okay. That's a pretty big distinction between most systems today. Our systems do not learn. Our systems adapt. And there's a, there is a, it seems like a semantic uh, thing there, but really they are very different. Um, so our systems adapt and the way they adapt is that they actually, um, they reorganize their models, internal models. So if you think of, of, uh, all of your plans and all of your goals, uh, how that looks. And I'll show you uh, some examples of that in just a minute. Um, our systems actually reorder 
all of those plans and goals. And we're co it's constantly doing this um, checking uh, against itself. So it has an error manager in it and it reorders uh, itself uh, in order to adapt to new information. And that includes novel scenarios, novel data. Um, so it's pretty, pretty powerful stuff. It's not like, um, it's not a machine learning technique. This is a, a, a different technique that's based on symbolic reasoning. Okay, so um, we can build them autonomously. We can build them semi-autonomously. They're explainable. Um, they can be updated in the field. So we have current projects where um, uh, intelligence officers update systems in the field. You know, as new information they're seeing comes in, um, our systems go out and get other information uh, and fuse it together for better intelligence. And we're even able to actually match, um, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a governed policy oriented world today, but match policies to behaviors and behaviors to policies, which is really important in a highly regulated environment, such as warfare. We see war as a highly regulated environment. Um, this is how we do it. Um, we are the only ones in the market that do what's referred to as multi-knowledge graph engineering. So we build knowledge graphs and we have a variety of formats of knowledge graphs and they're actually formats um, on the left here um, that you see the word belief in um, this is a concept related graph um, and it is you know the word belief is is very poignant in our world because we're using a belief desire and intent modeling paradigm for how that works and so this is a concept graph about the world, what you believe about the world. Um, some people refer to that as what, what the facts are. But essentially, what we take a little different look at what facts are, and we actually call them beliefs because we think they change, right? And then on the right-hand side, um, you have a different type of graph. This is a, a plan and goal graph. Uh, it's a, a well-known format for plan and goal graph. And essentially, you have actions at the bottom you have plans that those actions affect and those plans are related to some goal and so forth. And so eventually you get to some point where you're achieving a ultra goal, a high level goal. And so these are little snapshots of formats of the types of knowledge graphs that we engineer. And so this, this slide really shows how we, we actually compile those in Java code. And here at the bottom, we have our kind of our, our secret sauce, which is our cognitive graph engine. Now, our cognitive graph engine um, traverses these two graphs, and it's moving very quickly. It's very lightweight. And the cognitive graph engine, it was the focus of the research um, early on in our development of the graph engine. The graph engine has four components to it. Um, these components are all modeled off of neuroscience um, functional aspects of our brain. So when we say cognitive, that's pretty, we're, we're very serious about that. Um, so it allows, allows our system to actually monitor itself, um, understand language. It can do a, a, a lot of things. I, I actually tell people all the time that we have the most powerful cognitive graph engine ever developed. And I would challenge anyone to a match and IBM didn't want to match, didn't want to do it. So we still, we still uh, have a little bragging rights there. Um, okay. So you, you, you've learned a little bit about our systems, what they look like, how they work, why they're important. I've got some actual um, uh, videos to show you. Um, this video here is, and these videos are about seven minutes long. I've got about three or four of them. I just would like to play for you. Um, they're on our on the Velocity website, so um, you're welcome to jump over there and watch them in a different order if you'd like. But let's start with the Warfighter Associate, um, and these are all very well um, researched um, and deployed systems in various levels. And so let's let's I'll let this play for you, and hopefully the volume works well. Area of interest and the, in the operations are inherently complex and chaotic human endeavors. 
At critical times, soldiers are under tremendous pressure to quickly analyze overwhelming amounts of often incomplete and sometimes contradictory data, and to make decisions that have immediate impacts to mission success and human life. Providing actionable information to soldiers quickly is vital, but the information is often buried in a multitude of irrelevant messages, may be scattered across numerous information sources, or may require very specific expertise to analyze. Information will not help the soldier if the soldier cannot find it and understand it. In fact, it may be detrimental if it distracts the soldier or causes information overload. The Warfighter Associate provides role-based situation assessment and decision aiding for tactical and operational warfighters, ranging from platoon leaders to brigade staff or officers. The Velox Framework-based Warfighter Associate processes natural language input from tactical chat and structured input from Army Battle Command systems. To fit naturally into Warfighter workflow, the Warfighter Associate runs in the existing Department of Defense Applications ATAC and Raptor X. The Warfighter Associate provides the user with alerts based on configured commander's critical information requirements, or CCIR, and priority intelligence requirements, or PIR. It mines tactical chat and army battle command systems for relevant data, and informs the user if information related to a CCIR or PIR is detected. The Warfighter Associate provides course of action, ISR asset, and fires asset recommendations. Information requirements and ISR asset behavioral parameters are configurable on the user interface. The Warfighter Associate often uses Bayesian belief analysis to fuse data into items of relevance and can learn from feedback. Fundamental to the Warfighter Associate is the concept of alerts. The Warfighter Associate mines tactical chat and army battle command systems looking for information relevant to CCIR and PIR. If the information is about an event in the user's area of interest, and the information occurred after the information requirements first time information of value, or FTIOV, and before the information requirements last time information of value, or LTIOV, an alert is generated. The Warfighter Associate is constantly monitoring tactical chat and army battle command systems. When it finds data of potential relevance, in the first example, a report of small arms fire, it will assess the data in conjunction with its current model of the battlefield environment and alert the user if the data relates to a PIR or CCIR. Alerting the user involves issuing a notification, adding an icon to the map, panning and zooming the map to the event location, and adding a C2 pointer to the map to point out the icon added by the Warfighter Associate. When the user selects the notification, the Warfighter Associate will display a role-specific course of action recommendations for events contained in its knowledge base. It can handle novel IRs, but only recommends courses of action for the most critical combat events. The Warfighter Associate understands the position and capabilities of ISR and fires assets and recommends assets for events as appropriate. Assets and capabilities are managed at the battalion and brigade level. These recommendations are shown to all warfighters regardless of role and are made for all information requirements, including novel information requirements created on the user interface. Asset recommendations are updated as the battlefield situation changes. Ever since the Warfighter Associate learned of an active small arms fire event, it has been assessing suitability of nearby ISR assets. When the user selects the ISR tab in the small arms fire notification, the top three assets will be presented. In addition to each asset score, the Warfighter Associate displays three charts that provide transparency into its scoring algorithm. The first chart indicates sensor quality. The second indicates arrival time. The third chart displays a combination of other factors including stealth and survivability. Since battle space is different in every area of operations and commander's intent is different in every situation, capabilities are configured for the algorithm prior to mission. In this example, there are three excellent ISR assets. Nearby Shadow 15 is the top recommended ISR asset, due mostly its high-quality sensors. Tusk 2, a fixed-wing fighter, is recommended second, and Grey Eagle 2 is the number three recommended <coughs> asset. The Fires tab displays the top three recommended lethal and non-lethal assets, based on the type of event, asset capabilities, rules of engagement, and asset location. In this example, two Apaches and a fixed-wing fighter are recommended. The assets can either provide hey David, effects or be used for, for a non quick set. force. We are out of time. If you want to give a last few remarks and maybe link the uh, website to have the attendees can go finish the rest of the videos, 
Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, sorry, sorry, we ran a little bit, ran out of time there. Um, but absolutely, um, uh, we can go to the next uh, uh, next slides here and let me get out of this here. Hold on. Yeah, essentially, um, this is who we are. Um, we're Velocity. Uh, we build systems to watch your six. Yeah, we've been doing it for 30 years, and we'd like to meet some people in the Navy. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dave, for the presentation. And thank you for everyone in the audience. And like um, it says on the screen, there, if you want to check out their website, it is right there. But our next presentation will begin in a few minutes at 1135. And hope to see you all there. Thank you.